So good morning and welcome. I hope everyone took advantage of the uh, coffee out front for a nice early start. I'm Frank Verastra. I'm a senior vice president here, and I have the Schlesinger chair, the honor of having the Schlesinger chair. And for this morning's meeting, I'm also going to be your safety officer. So um, for 30 seconds, just to the admin side, uh, this is actually pretty easy since most of you came in the front door. There's two exits uh, out of the building in the unlikely event that we're asked to evacuate. Um, if you follow the signs on the exit side to go downstairs through the back, it takes you out through the alley behind the Jefferson Hotel and dumps you out on M Street. If you come back on the front side, down the stairs or down the ramp, out the front door and across the street to the park next to the Beacon Hotel and that'll work just fine. We're all set. But you can also follow me on the way out or you can follow Dr. Hamry on the way out because he always is good at leading them. We're very excited this morning. There's a number of times that we do outlooks um, where we like to see companies' perspectives on what's going on. So in addition to EIA and Adams here this morning or the IEA, when companies have a different perspective on investment and they go out either 2040 or 2050, you can start to see the changes because that's where the money's put. And today we're just extremely excited to have Eric Werners with us. So Eric is the chief economist at Statoil. He's vice president. He has a most impressive resume. He's done macroeconomics, investment and in technology, um, has had government positions as well as industry positions. Within Statoil itself, he's been head of corporate planning, head of global strategy, and now in the chief economist role, he actually has the opportunity to produce and edit this trends outlook to 2040. And there's some interesting things here that you really want to take, because Statoil's view, when we look at the American companies, the European companies, and then some of the other international folks from different places around the world, the perspective is really important. So we're excited to have Eric back here. Uh, he's been here before. And we want to have a lively discussion. So we're going to allot, you know, first 35, 40 minutes of presentation, and then we'll uh, engage in an exchange of questions, if that's okay. But Eric, wonderful to have you join us. And uh, please, Thank you. get started. Thank you. Thanks for the kind introduction. Thanks for having me here. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be back. Good weather. We don't have that in Norway. Might be this today, but we haven't had good weather at all this year. So it's nice to, nice to be here. Um, I will try and present some of the headlines of our Energy Perspectives Outlook. This is an annual thing. Uh, this is where we summarize work that we have to do as part of giving advice to our corporate uh, decision makers in terms of what the world will look like and, and ultimately also what price assumptions to use for different types of, of crude oils and different types of products and different types of gas. Uh, I will not tell you the price forecast today, but I'll tell you the basis for, 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 uh, for our demand, supply and demand balances as, as, as they come out and, and, uh, and give you the forecast for, for global energy. Uh, the forecast goes to 2040. Uh, some people are now starting to talk about 2100. Uh, even even our decision makers, our political decision makers, are talking about 2100. Uh, looking that far into the future uh, is difficult. It's difficult to forecast uh, the foreign exchange rate and the oil price tomorrow. So it is so it is difficult to forecast to 2040. But, but given that we are an energy company which makes investments that possibly starts producing 2025, if we make uh, the discovery today. And then they might produce for 50, 60 years, if it's big enough, like the Johannes Valdorp field we have in, in Norway, for instance. Then we are bound to have it. We, we need to have a view at least as far out as we think we can have some clarity in what we're, we're, what we're seeing. Uh, 2100 is beyond that, I should say. But, uh, but 2040 is something we hope to be, you know, at least have some look at. But as, as you will see, uh, let's see, I'll do this. That works, yeah. Um, Reflecting upon the uncertainties, uh, we have both last year and this year decided that we develop three scenarios. So we present three different development paths. We do not assign specific probabilities for any of those out outcomes. If you take any of them uh, at the detailed level for granted, then the, 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 the point probability of exactly that happening is very low for all the three scenarios. But what we hope to do is we span out an outcome space and then possibly the, and hopefully the, the, the actual development will take place within, within that outcome space spanned out by the three scenarios. Uh, it's very much an energy publication. That's what it is. This, this word cloud behind me shows uh, 
shows the, the, the size of the letters is proportional to the number of times it's mentioned in the report. Uh, it's about economic growth. Uh, it's about more, more about, about demand, demand than supply, even though, I mean, we present relatively detailed supply forecasts for oil and also for gas. But, but it, uh, there is sufficient amounts of energy available to us, and, and, uh, and, and the fuel mix and, uh, and uh, the level of energy produced and consumed will be, in that sense, be more driven by demand factors, we think. Uh, if we had done this 10 years ago and more people were concerned by, about peak oil supply, we might have looked, the report might have looked slightly differently. Uh, we're, looking at, uh, we're looking at scenarios, as I said. We're talking about large regions like China, like OECD, and that's, that's what the, this report is, is about. Then when we do these forecasts, um, it's important to think uh, or to be aware that, that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, and that uncertainty is not going to go away. Um, and uh, we show this by, on the left side here, we have uh, fossil fuel prices over the last 18 years. Since, since we started quoting a natural gas price in the UK, the NBP, that's the, equi the European equivalent of the Henry Hub gas price. So here we have the two, gas pri two central gas prices, we have the coal price, and we have the Brent oil price over the last 18 years. And it's, it's a history of volatility and change, and that's gonna, that's gonna stay there for us. So what, we're, what, what, what we have to prepare for, both consumers and, and producers, is a world where the prices go up and down, like in all commodity markets. Uh, relatively low price elasticity on the, in the short term, both on the supply and the demand, and, and if you have a change in the fundamentals like we had last year when shale oil surprised on the upside and Saudi Arabia surprised us on on their policy stance, and then the demand side surprised negatively. Those three factors together, a very small change in, in actual supply and demand, about a million barrels out of 90 million barrels, but the price crashed. And that's what happens in these types of markets. That's going to continue. So what we can hope to do is to be robust through these cycles, and then try and estimate you know, being vaguely right and avoid being precisely wrong in terms of where we're going. Another side of forecasting is to be able to, or not being able to, forecast things that change rapidly. IEA, EIA, and us are challenged and criticized by NGOs, in particular in Norway, but also elsewhere, that we are underestimating growth in new renewables. We're not able to capture the, the, the rapid growth rates, and that's true. And then, by implication, they say that we underestimate the growth going to 2040. And this chart shows a couple of those factors. Uh, and the, the yellow one, which you might not see, yeah, you see it, it's pretty good, is uh, the 50 doubling of solar generation globally, from nothing to a little something. Uh, it, it, I have to show it on the right-hand scale. It, it needs a separate axis because it's 50 doubled over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, but there's also other factors on the supply side. The Habsa price, shale oil is already mentioned, 13 times as high shale oil production now in the United States as 10 to 15 years ago. That's the blue line there. And uh, if I showed shale gas, which is not in the, in, the, in the chart, that would be seven times as high as only eight years ago. And we haven't been able to forecast those either. But then in, in energy, it's not only about supply, it's also about demand. And there's a couple of other factors that have been difficult to estimate, and I'll, I'll just point to one of them. And that's the growth in international Chinese tourism. It's the blue, it's the dark blue, no, it's the light blue line. The light blue line, that's grown from, and the good, good thing about China is that they have good statistics. They, I mean, everybody in, everybody in the Chinese authorities know when a Chinese leaves the country, right, and comes back. So, 10 million Chinese tourists by 2000, 110 last year. If you extrapolate that growth rate to 2040, you'll have 9 billion Chinese tourists traveling. It's like Norwegians traveling abroad seven or eight times a year, everyone. That's a lot of energy demand. We don't believe that exponential growth is going to continue either. But it, it's going to be, it might be high, and it, might, and it contributes to a lot of energy demand growth. It contributes to air traffic. So don't take short, relatively short exponential growth rates for granted. We're talking about S-curves here, which grow rapidly for a while, and then they peak. That goes for solar energy, and it goes for Chinese tourism. But we might be wrong on some of these. Then when we look at drivers for the different scenarios, uh, we focus both on, on uh, 
climate change, climate change policies. Uh, we focus on technology, we focus on, on uh, behavior, and economic growth. And those combinations, in addition to geopolitics, will decide and affect where we're going. And here I, we've just listed in some pictures showing, you know, the relationship between Ru Russia and the West is an important driver together with other geopolitical and certain factors in one of the scenarios that we have. Um, technology development in, in new renewable energy, uh, electric electrification of transportation are the two, two key factors in arriving at the two degree uh, trajectory for CO2 emissions. So we'll look at that in one of the scenarios. And then fundamentally, one big question is, of course, uh, consumer behavior, the need for electricity. We've shown Rio de Janeiro during, during a night. They need electricity, and uh, they're clo relatively close to equator. What happens at equator when, when it gets dark? If they're all on solar panels, the efficiency of a solar panel around equator goes from 100% to zero within 20 minutes. In northern Norway during the summer, we can have produced solar energy at midnight. But around the equator, the, the, the system uh, characteristics when you have intermittent renewable is something that is difficult to handle. Because solar energy rapidly falls off exactly during the same 20 minutes that everybody turns on the light. And some of us have been in Africa and experienced what happens in an African city when everybody turns on the light. The electricity vanishes. So the system characteristics of producing electricity in large populations with intermittent renewables is a challenge. It can be handled, but it's a challenge, and it requires backup and investments. And that's some of the things that would drive the development as well. And then finally, this famous picture from, from National Geographic, where they took all the products in a normal American home in Ohio out of the home, that all the products that are made of oil and gas. And if you foresee Chinese and Indian consumers becoming part of the world middle class over the next 35 years. An important driver for oil and gas demand is as feedstock into consumer products. I'm not saying that, uh, that the average OECD consumer will consume as much plastic as the average American in Ohio, but still, it's an important driver. for. So we have to remember that oil and gas and also coal is an important feedstock in manufacturing production. It's not only about energy and electricity. That will also limit uh, how, how quickly you can get out of fossil, fossil fuels. And finally, the, we have a big picture of, of, uh, of a UN assembly here. And, uh, and of course, dr arriving at anything close to a two degree scenario requires a form of global decision making, global cooperation that is, uh, to put it mildly, challenging. But it has to happen. So then doing this, we have three scenarios. We call them renewal, reform, and rivalry. Uh, the renewal scenario is a scenario, it's, that's a, it's constructed in a different way than the other scenarios. That's a backcasting scenario. What we've done there is we've taken the, the CO2 emissions necessary to arrive at the two degree target in 2040. And then we've backcasted and found one possible way of arriving there. There are many ways we can uh, arrive there, but this is one. The reform scenario and the rivalry scenario are forecasting scenarios where we change assumptions going forward and we end up where we are, or, or where we end up in terms of CO2 emissions, energy demand, etc. The reform scenario is a scenario where we, uh, we take the signals given by governments before the Paris uh, climate conventions and we assume a gradual tightening of energy and climate policies in line with that and beyond, much tougher energy and climate policies than what we see currently in the world. That goes uh, with carbon pricing, energy, uh, energy efficiency standards, emission standards, et cetera, et cetera. We have a GDP growth forecast. I'll come back to that. But it's slightly lower than last year's forecast to 2040. It's slightly lower than the IEA, 2.8% per year on average to 2040. Um, and combine that with, with, with the energy efficiency assumptions that come out of this. Uh, with 2.8% economic growth, we will be more than twice as rich in 2040 as a whole as we are, than we are today, but we will only use 30% more energy. So the energy intensity chart, which I show to the left here, where well, the reform scenario is the, is the blue triangles, show that on, as a whole, the, glo the globe is 40% more energy efficient in 2040 than today. 
that's a more rapid, much more rapid energy uh, efficiency development than what we've seen historically over the last decades, and in particular, uh, particular over the last 15 years, but because of the heavy energy content in the Chinese economic development. The rivalry scenario is a scenario where we build upon geopolitical conditions. We start out with that. Uh, the permanent unrest, more or less, in Middle East and North Africa, uh, the relationship between China and its neighbors in, the Asia, in Asia, in the Asian region, and then the relationship or, or non-relationship between Russia and the West as indicators of the potential development of the world in a direction where we do not trust each other as well as we have done or as we would wish, uh, more focus on energy security, like in Europe at the moment, instead of common solutions, which means that, uh, that different regions of the world will use more of its own energy sources instead of importing from a neighbor they don't trust. And the result of that would be, in, in our minds, uh, uh, still focus on renewable energy, but also a lot more use of coal, in particular in the regions where you need to import gas, which is Asia and Europe. So the energy mix in that scenario is much darker, much more fossil, much more CO2 intensive. And you see that on the orange lines, orange dots in the, in the, in the chart to the right. So that's a scenario where economic growth is 2%, not 2.8. So the energy demand is lower, but energy demand is more CO2 intensive. That's that kind of world. And then the reforms, uh, and then the, uh, as I said, the renewal scenario with two degree target, take it for granted, find a way there. One of the ways is a, an even tougher assumption on energy efficiency. In that scenario, we have the same or even slightly higher growth on average to 2040. 2.9%. One of the reasons being that for in the reform and the rivalry scenarios, we have taken into account that if we don't reach the two degree target, we will gradually see increasing climate costs. So we have explicitly reduced economic development in those two scenarios in the 30s towards 2040, taken down economic growth because we have to hand, increasingly have to handle climate costs. In the renewal scenarios, the scenario we don't. So that's one of the reasons why the economic development there is slightly faster than in the reform scenario. Much higher energy efficiency, we assume almost no growth in energy demand. That means that the world is more than twice as rich in 2040, but we don't use more energy. That's not a walk in the park. That's a hugely challenging assumption. And then we have much tighter uh, energy and uh, climate policies, rapidly increasing carbon pricing, and we've also looked specifically at how can you get there by re, re, more or less revolutionizing global transport, private transport, and the electricity sector. I'll, I'll come back to what that means. But that's one way of doing it. And then we get the CO2 intensity down, as you see. Then, same story as uh, s uh, several years, new map this year, the global center is in Asia. More than half of the global population lives within 4,000 kilometers of Hong Kong and they are becoming OECD citizens in terms of average per capita income during this period. So what happens there will affect everything, including energy demand. The map here shows areas of the world where, there, where there's currently living a billion people, and there are three of those areas in Southeast Asia, so an indication of the population density. And then you see, can you see the energy demand development in the three scenarios for, for different regions, and note that the three OECD regions at the bottom, they, we don't have any growth in OECD energy demand in any of the scenarios, and we have a reduction in the renewal scenario. So all energy demand growth takes place in the emerging economies, in particular in Asia, but also gradually in, in uh, Africa and in Latin America. So handling also the, these three different scenarios, handling global growth in CO2 emissions, is a lot about changing the energy mix in the OECD countries, but it's even more so avoiding the consequences of relatively rapid uh, energy demand growth, in particular in, middle, in the Middle East and in Asia. And we cannot tell these people that they cannot have the economic development that we've had. So we have to find a solution where they can grow their economies and using the energy required to do that, and at the same time solve the sustainability issues. If we don't, we meet sustainability problems long before 2040. Yeah, this is the, the GDP trajectory, so I'm not going to spend much time on them. Just suffice to say, and you see it clearly, that uh, the, the difference between the reform and the renewal scenario is first that since the renewal scenario is a huge transition of our energy systems, it, it, 
in practical terms, it would mean dismantling of perfectly functioning coal-fired power plants and replacing that with something else. Then for a while, that transition is going to cost us money in terms of lower GDP growth. So we have lower GDP growth in that scenario compared to the reform scenario for a while. But then towards the end of the period, as the economy has become more efficient, we have eliminated all fossil fuel subsidies, uh, the green technology is working, and we don't meet increasing climate costs, then GDP growth in that scenario is assumed to be higher than in the reform scenario. So that's that trajectory. And then we have the rivalry scenario lower all throughout the period, and in particular in the, in the beginning. And then the, I'm going to show you now a series of relatively complicated charts, but, I, but we build them up, so I think it's, it's going to be understandable. The chart to the right shows the composition of energy demand in the different scenarios across fuels. It's the same chart that I showed per region a couple of slides back. You have 20, the 2012 uh, mix, the energy mix there, where you see, and then we have the, the shares in, in the donut to the left currently. Fossil fuels are... 80% of current energy mix, more than 80%. Relatively evenly distributed on coal and, and, and oil, and then slightly lower for gas. Fossil fuel share of global energy mix has been above 80% since 19, well before 1970. In 1972, it was about 85%. That was before the, the first oil crisis. It was at 85, 86%. And currently, it's, it's still about 80%, 40 years later. It serves to show that, trans, that changing the global energy mix, in particular in a situation where energy demand is growing, and we're using two and a half times more energy now than we did in 1970, changing that takes time. It's a huge system that has to change. And then when we look at the changes that we're now forecasting or backcasting for the renewal and, and the two other scenarios, those are relatively large, and I'll come back to that. Uh, the, 50 time doubling of solar energy that I showed you, the yellow line in one of the first charts, is half of the pink sliver at the top of the donut, roughly. It's, one, it's, it's less than, that's about a half of a percent of global energy demand today. That's the 50, result of the 50 doubling. So it's grown from nothing to, to a little something in, global, in, a, in a global setting. So, so what we're talking about in new renewables is this pink part at the top, and that's growing rapidly, much more rapidly in all scenarios than any other energy source. But it, is, it starts out at a very low level. That's why it doesn't grow more to the end of the period than it, than it, than it does. So and then in the reform scenario, uh, we have relatively significant changes in the fuel mix. Uh, the fossil fuel mix becomes less carbon intensive because gas grows at the expense of coal and oil. And you see that the coal share is down to 25, uh, the, the oil share is slightly, slightly down, and, uh, and the gas share is slightly growing. We still have 75% of, of the energy mix being fossil. Rapid growth in new renewables takes that, new, that share to 7%. Small changes in the other types of energy, nuclear, hydro, and what we call old renewables, which is biomass. But that is not sufficient to lead to a two degree CO2 emission target. Then you need to go to the renewal scenario. That has much lower energy demand. You see that in the, in the columns to the right. And it has relatively much larger changes in the fuel mix. But we still have more than 60% of the overall energy mix being fossil. We don't have to go to zero by 2040, or 2050, or 2060 to reach the, CO, uh, the, the two degree target. But in that scenario, what we've done is we've reduced coal demand by 50%. Overall energy demand doesn't grow, and we've taken the coal share down. The coal share comes out at less than 15%. But we still have 60% fossil fuels in a two degree scenario. That is really, really important. I'll come back to that. And for an oil company, it's very, very important because it tells us something about what to do going forward. And then the rivalry scenario, the final one, note that the coal share there is actually increasing. Uh, it serves to show that the world we're in is an important driver for what energy mix we'll end up with. If, if we are to reach something that is good for all of us in terms of sustainability, we need to cooperate. It's going to be extremely difficult to do that in a situation where we don't trust each other, like in the rivalry scenario. 
because then we will use more of our own resources, and that's coal. And we don't have the money to, to transform the technology, to change the economy in a way that is needed, because economic growth will be lower. And in that scenario, renewable, uh, new, renewals, uh, new renewable energy grows much more than the other sources as well, but it, but it only constitutes 4% of the energy mix by the end of the period. Then, as I said, very important message. In all these scenarios, oil and gas are here to stay. There is some coal left also in a renewable scenario, but that, there we've taken out a lot because in order to maximize the energy, uh, the, the size of the energy that we can use within a given CO2 budget, taking out coal is a good idea because you get twice as much energy per CO2 unit if you use gas instead. But in all these scenarios, we have oil and gas being here. In the, in the reform scenario, we have a peak in oil demand. Not everybody who does these types of forecasts have that. We have at around 108 million barrels per day in 2030. And then it gradually tapers off as uh, the transportation sector in the emerging economies is, saturate, is saturating. So we, we end up with some 103 million barrels per day. Uh, and then per region, you can see that in the, the, the columns there is the regional distribution of the demand in the reform scenario. Then you have the global gas demand that continues to grow in the reform scenario as well. Slightly more than, than overall energy demand, so by more than 30% throughout the period. And then I'll focus on two things. One is to look at the light blue squares. That's the oil demand in the renewal scenario. This is the scenario where we rapidly change uh, global energy and climate policies. We, I'll come back to what we do here, but we, we, we assume a, a rapid electrification of transportation. Then oil demand comes down quickly, but only by 15% to 2040. We still need close to 80 million barrels per day of oil in 2040 in that scenario, in spite of this electrification of the transportation sector. And one of the reasons is that uh, transportation is not only private cars. It's these uh, aircraft flying all the Chinese tourists that I talked about, right? It's uh, the trucking needed to transport consumption goods. IEA last year presented, uh, when they presented their forecast, they showed that 30% of the growth in global oil demand from now to 2030 is Chinese trucking alone. And then you can add on India, Pakistan, Indonesia, Latin America. So, and trucking is not that easily electrified. Shipping is not that easily electrified. And then we also need oil for petrochemical industries, which will be growing when everybody gets richer. So 80 million barrels and 15% more gas. We need more gas in the two degree scenario than today. So in total, oil and gas will be roughly equal. Oil and gas demand will be almost the same as today in that scenario. And then we have added some pink lines, ranges, which shows how much can we potentially produce from existing fields of oil and gas, producing oil and gas today, when you take account of decline rates. That's the, part, part of the oil and gas industry is to fight decline every year, and decline in oil every year is more than the total shale oil production in the United States. It, pu it puts the shale oil revolution into perspective. If we were to stop doing anything now, Two years down the road, we would almost have to replace the whole of Saudi Arabia's production because of demand growth and decline. So in 2040, we can at the most produce somewhere between 20 and 40 million barrels per day from existing fields, even, though we, I mean, even if we work these fields to maintain, and et cetera, et cetera. But we have to invest in keeping production as high as possible. We have to explore to find new resources, and we have to take existing resources and make them into reserves through investments. And the difference between 30 million, which is the middle of that range in 2040, and 80 is 50 million barrels per day. That's five times the current US total oil production. It's five times Saudi Arabia, and it's five times Russia. It's a huge challenge to be able to deliver the, the oil and gas that is necessary in a two degree scenario. And if you don't believe in a two degree scenario, and you think about the reform scenario, we need to, to, give, to produce even more. That's why a company like Statoil will continue to explore for oil and gas, even though we, everybody wishes the two-degree scenario. Not everybody believes in it, but if we were able to deliver a scenario where we, we, economic growth is higher than in the other scenarios, and we achieve the two-degree target, everybody should wish, wish for that. It's a pretty nice future. Even if we believe in that, 
we, are, we have to continue to explore for oil and gas because we have to deliver that energy. It's going to be more challenging because the prices will be lower in that scenario than in the other one, but it's a job we have to do. Then I'll, I'm approaching the end here, but I'll show you just as an example how, what we did with this renewal scenario and, and how tough it is. Look at the middle chart. This is what we end up with in private road transportation. That's basically light duty vehicles. The result here, if you look at the, at the column to the right, is that we go from virtually nothing in terms of electricity as a fuel share. You wouldn't believe this if you were in the bus lanes in the western part of Oslo, because, uh, because uh, we, have a, we have a phenomenal increase in electric vehicles, but it's in Oslo only, or in Norway only. Uh, California, you see them, and you see if you, if you come to, to Amsterdam and you take a taxi, you'll see that they've subsidized the Tesla, so, so, so there's a line of Teslas lining up for you as a taxi. But electricity is virtually nothing in the current fleet of light duty vehicles. You don't see it. There is a, there's a slightly per, low, uh, light purple line there. But if you go to 2040, what we've done here is we have 35% of the, 36% of the fuel mix in 2040 in that part of the transportation sector being electricity, one way or the other, either full electric, hybrids, or hydrogen, or whatever, globally. I'll come back to what that means for the for OECD, but it's in the OECD area, we have almost 100% of the new car sales by 2040 being electric. And that, that then transfers to the left. You'll see the electric share in the transportation sector as a whole, much lower, and then also lower demand there uh, because, because uh, we take out oil of the transportation sector and, and we make it much more energy efficient, but, but there's still a lot of oil demand for aircraft, shipping, and trucking. So that's one part of it. One way of doing this is basically to revolutionize transport or private duty, light duty vehicles, private road transport. But it doesn't help to put an electric vehicle into China or Latvia if you're concerned with CO2 emissions. In Latvia, 100% of the electricity generation is based on coal. So putting an electric vehicle in there, and especially if it's a fantastically much more efficient combustion engine that you replace it with, which you will do in 2040, would increase CO2 emissions. So you have to decarbonize the power sector for this policy to make sense, and that's what we also do. So on the right side there, you'll see a couple of data on the electricity sector. First of all, when you electrify transport, the share of electricity in final energy consumption goes up. And those are, that's the squares, the purple squares, going from some 20% today in overall use of energy, only 20% is electricity, to in the renewal scenario, uh, we go to more than 30% globally. And then we also have to decarbonize the, the sector, so we'd go from less than 5% New, renewal, new renewable share today, which is these uh, circles, the, the, the pink circles, less than 5% today to more than 40%. If we do that, we reach the two degree target. So we have more than 40% of global electricity generation coming from so sun and wind. It's not capacity, it's generation. Then we reach the, CO, the two degree target. You could have it a different combination, much more nuclear energy would also deliver the same thing. More CCS could also deliver it, carbon capture and storage. But this is one combination. And just to illustrate the challenge, look at the right one here. This is North America. Here we go, we assume in a renewal scenario, 50% of electricity generation in North America is sun or wind, or geothermal, which is relatively small here. This is what it takes. Currently you have four or 5%. It's a challenge to be put it mildly. And then just to, to finalize, uh, if some of you just bought a new SUV, which I see that uh, Americans are increasingly doing because the gasoline price is low at the moment, well, it might be the last SUV you buy or your kids won't because they'll buy 60, 65% of the fleet is gonna be electric vehicles in North America. That's the 36% globally, 60, 65% in the OECD area. That's 100% of new car sales. There's one way of getting to the two degree scenario. It might still be an SUV, right? It might be 
the third generation Tesla SUV, which is supposed to, the first one is supposed to come, I guess, but it's going to be electric or hybrid. But 65% of the fuel use. It's a huge challenge, but it can be done. And then finally, CO2 emissions. As I said, it's no surprise that we reached the CO2 target or the CO2 level that the IEA says is necessary in the renewal scenario because that's what we've taken for granted, we've backcasted. So in the light blue columns to the left, global CO2 emissions rapidly fall off and re are reduced by 40% compared to today and on a trajectory down. In the reform and the rivalry scenario, we don't reach them. But we have a peak in CO2 emissions in 20, around 2030 in the reform scenario, when transportation sector and oil demand peaks. And then it comes off gradually in the reform scenario. In the rivalry, rivalry scenario, it go, continues to grow. And in fact, in the 2040, the CO2 emissions in that scenario is higher than in the reform scenario because of the large coal share, in spite of energy demand being lower. And then I've shown for, for this audience, I've taken out also the CO2 emissions in, in North America. And note, here you see also part of the political challenge before Paris. In, in the OECD area, OECD North America included, CO2 emissions will come down in any scenario. We will not use more energy. We become more energy efficient. And we try, in, in particular in North America, you go away from coal into gas and then also more renewables. So CO2 emissions here will come down. The challenge globally is in the other regions of the world, including China. Look at the right chart of this. So it, it, in order to have a more CO2 efficient energy mix, we have to solve, as I said, the problem of providing more energy to the emerging economies and at the same time do something with the CO2 mix. And, and in our scenarios, both in the reform and rivalry scenario, uh, CO2 emissions in China peak around 2030, which, by the way, is when Xi Jinping promised Barack Obama that it would peak when they did their handshake in October last year. The problem is, of course, that it peaks at much too high a level. So we have to get it more down, and, and the renewal scenario is one way of doing that. So that's a quick overview of three potential paths to 2040 in terms of energy mix. Thank you. Eric, thank you. Your reputation around here is always that it's content rich, that you're a serious and thoughtful guy, and that you always come well prepared and you did not disappoint. Um, it just strikes me. So uh, two quick questions. Uh, investment needed to get to the reform or the renewable scenario, right, between now and 2040, if, especially if there's discontinuity in, in the system that we have to um, quickly change out over 20 years a lot of existing coal plants or, or pipeline infrastructure, you still have between 65 and 75 percent fossil fuel use under of all the scenarios, but that you target to get the emissions reduction. What, what kind of investment does that take? Well, I, um, we don't have uh, we don't model the investments uh, necessary, but we have looked at what IEA said mm -hmm. last year uh, in their World Energy Investment Outlook, uh, and they looked to 20, in that scenario they looked to 20 or in that book before before the it was published before the last World Energy Outlook they they went to 2035, and they did a rel relatively thorough look at uh, at what type of investments are needed uh, in the different scenarios. And, and, and their scenarios are relatively similar to ours, both in a new policy scenario and the 450. Um, and they conclude that uh, around $50,000 billion, $50 trillion US dollars, must be invested in the global energy sector to satisfy demand by 2035. Um, more, yeah, so 52, 53 trillion in the two degree scenario. Uh, because there we need a larger investment in renewables and we need a larger investment in energy efficiency. And some 48 trillion in, in the new, uh, new policy scenario. What is, what is, and the only energy source where we can invest less on average for the next 21 years or 20 years than what we have done over the last 15, the only energy source where we sort of can relax and not invest as much as we have done is coal. In all the other energy sources, that be it nuclear, oil, gas, the power sector as a whole, 
including fossil fuels within the power sector. Um, and of course, renewables in itself, we need a much higher investment level um, in both scenarios. And what, what is a bit concerning, or, or at least gives, gives, uh, gives um, arguments for reflection, is that uh, um, when you look at what's happened in the oil and gas industry, I mean, that, that's where we look at. If you look at what, what we've been doing the last 10 years, it's, it's, an in, it's an industry that has become significantly more capital intensive. Right. Uh, we invest about four times as much as we did in 2004 uh, as in our peer group, uh, 10, 15 largest international oil companies. Um, and we produce exactly the same amount of oil and gas as we did 10 years ago. So we're four, in, in one sense, four times as capital intensive. And what IEA tells us is that in order to deliver all this energy for the future, we need to become more capital intensive. And we have to do that in a world where there's a lot of uncertainty about geopolitics. Yep. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty about future energy and climate policies, not to mention that prices of oil have been uh, reduced by 50 percent. So it's, uh, this is not a walk in the park. Exactly. And then the other piece is that you have alluded to it, that it takes a higher carbon price as the market signal to get you there in addition to technology improvements and correct policy. Do you forecast yeah. a, a carbon price? Yeah, and, yeah it's, um, and in, in particular in, in, in terms of both to drive the technological development on, on, the, on carbon capture and storage, uh, but in particular to, to drive the correct incentives in, in decarbonizing the electricity mix, we need a carbon price to, to correct the price between coal and gas, basically. Uh, and in, in our scenario, in the, in, the, in the reform scenario, we have a gradual buildup of carbon pricing explicitly or implicitly. I mean, you, we're not very, you, don't have to, you don't have to put in a tax in, in, on, on this side of the Atlantic, the word tax is, uh, has a different connotation than in Europe. Uh, but, but you could have a, a trading system or you could have implicit uh, carbon pricing through direct regulations, which, uh, which is an, it's an interesting phenomenon that that is liked better here than in, than in Europe mm -hmm. through emission standards and so on. But so what, what we have is de facto a, a carbon price that is gradually increasing to some $50 per ton, I think around 2030. And then, okay. you know, so, and then in the renewal scenario, we're talking about something that, and it, it's not in all regions, that is in the key regions. Uh, in the renewal scenario, it's global. You take out all fossil fuel subsidies and the carbon price rises to some 100 to $150 by 2040. Okay, I figured that so, and then in our assumptions, we, I should say that in, as, as an example of the fact that Statoil does not necessarily build on any one of these scenarios in, in our investment decisions is that for internal purposes, we have a $50 per ton CO2 price on everything, no matter where it is from 2020 and onwards, so which is somewhere in between these two yes. scenarios. Okay. Yeah. okay, and then one final point before I open it up, since we do geopolitics here, can you do a deeper dive on the rivalry scenario? Just do a little color commentary on, on beyond the, the specific comments about. Yeah, well, it, I guess we, we developed, the, the main ideas for that scenario was also included in, in last year's, uh, one of the scenarios last year, we call that policy paralysis. We wrote the, the draft chapters of that, uh, or the draft ideas for that before we modeled it, a um, couple of weeks before Putin went into the Crimea. So it, it sort of fit very well when we then finished the report. And, and then over the last year, we've seen increasing signals as to how that, uh, not only Russia and, and the West, but, but, uh, but uh, sort of how the ongoing <coughs> insecurity, unsecured situation in the Middle East is, is affecting markets um, and, and the, sort of the, the worries around what's happening there. Uh, and then also we see, we see signals of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, continued uh, bad relations in Asia. So in one sense, um, I mean, if you read this uh, with sort of finding out what has happened over the last year, which of these scenarios it does look most likely. Maybe the rivalry scenario right. contains a lot of the variables that are, that, uh, that, that what we see now. Um, that scenario is, uh, as I said, because, because, partly because of lack of trust, sanctions, which we see now, right? I mean, uh, economic growth is much lower in, both in Russia, but also in Europe, because of the sanctions. Um, you can foresee a scenario where we do military spending buildups with, with no m m economic return. Uh, and then what we clearly see signals about is, uh, is uh, uh, measures being taken to avoid depending on somebody you don't like on your energy imports. 
and that is uh, in Europe, you could foresee that, uh, that uh, elsewhere as well. And uh, that means, first of all, it means a more costly energy mix to the extent that importing something is more efficient. Uh, autarky and, and, uh, and beggar thy neighbor policies are, are never very efficient. And, uh, and, uh, and the consequence of that also is that Russia will use more gas uh, because they have a lot of it. But uh, both Europe and Asia will use more coal. Right. Yeah, we've done a lot of work on um, economic statecraft and this, this whole notion mm. of fragmented globalization. And is that the route we're heading? Yeah. And it makes a lot of difference. It does. And I also, when, when I, well, I've been challenged a bit about the energy assumptions because you can, what you can also foresee is that a security of supply focus also leads to increased incentives for renewable energy. Right. So, so you, can, you, you could foresee that as well. But, uh, but um, at least in, as in a period where you, you cannot, I mean, we can't switch from 100% coal to 100% renewables overnight in, in countries in East Europe, for instance. So, so, so at least you will for a while have much more use of your own resources, probably. Okay. So this bears more analysis. Okay, questions. We have three simple rules here. Um, identify yourself, uh, wait for a microphone first since we have a bigger crowd identify yourself and to the extent that you want to make a comment that's fine but if you pose your question in the form of a question we always find that helpful so please <laughs> I'm going to start with Scott and then I'll go to Bill in the back Scott Ogunbaugh CSIS um, I have two but I'll just go with one the you talked about the sort of growth and the sort of the future of Asia as being one of these drivers. Well, one of the things that you see out there right now is a focus on particularly East Asian growth declining over the next decade. So really, it might become the scenario where it's really Southeast Asia and the focus on Southeast Asia. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you see as growth factors in Southeast Asia that might change our perspectives on this out to 2040. Should I answer or should I yeah, take you Okay. Yeah, well, um, we have a relatively rapid, not rapid, but a, yeah, a, a, a relatively clear slowdown in economic growth throughout this period, both in, both in China and in other parts of the, sort of the, the most developed part of, of Asia. Um, because there is a limit as to how, how long they can, they can grow with the rates that we've seen over the last couple of years, partly because the potential for moving, uh, moving labor from relatively low productive industries like, like agriculture into other industries is, is uh, almost taken out. Uh, the, 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 the increased growth impetus of continued investments is slowing down, and they're also changing the economic model, in particular in China. And then finally, also, as they become richer, they catch up with us, right? I mean, per capita income will approach, in, in China, per capita income will approach Korea towards the end of the period, and then the, the potential for, for continued higher total factor productivity growth is also assumed to be sort of come down. The, uh, the catch-up effect, the, 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 value of the, the value of writing copyright with a space between copy and write uh, also becomes, uh, becomes less. And that goes also for parts of, the, of the Southeast Asia as well. Uh, but, uh, but some of these countries will continue to grow faster. India will grow much faster than China going forward. Uh, on average for, throughout the period, because the potential is much larger. They start out at a much lower per capita income level, and the potential for moving, moving labor, uh, increasing female participation in the, in the labor force, et cetera, et cetera, is larger. So, and you'll see the same there. It's, but of course, and some of the countries in, uh, uh, and you'll see the same effect in Indonesia. I, I can't remember exactly. We, we don't have that detailed data per country in that region, but, uh, but as a whole, uh, their growth rates will be somewhere around that of China, or slightly lower. So it's, um, but that's, uh, that's how it is in our forecast. Bill? Uh, a little shortly. Thanks. Bill Hederman, DOE. With regard to your uh, taking a $50 per ton carbon cost into account in your investing, have you detected differences in your investment patterns and your competitors at this point? And could you talk about that at all? Yeah, just in what's actually observable? Uh, no, not really. Uh, it, many of our competitors do something of the same. Uh, as far as, uh, as far, we don't know exactly, but at least we, we hear the buzz about it, is that both, uh, both BP and Shell, and, I, and in fact also ExxonMobil, 
is, is using carbon pricing uh, across, across their portfolio at different levels, but still. Um, and of course, over time, it will affect our patterns. And, and on the, I mean, on the margin, at the margin, it affects the, the MPV of a, of a carbon intensive uh, type of production much more than, the, than, a, than a less carbon intensive. Um, but given also that our, so, so, but we haven't seen that, uh, but of course we, we might end up quarreling in a license where we are both together, and if one uses a carbon price that is higher than the others, then, then one of the partners might be less willing to go into that. So, but, but I think, uh, I think the sort of the, the composition of our portfolios is also so different still that, that, that those types of differences overshadow any impact from, from that. But uh, I wouldn't, uh, yeah, maybe we might have those discussions in any given license at some point in the future. Yeah, I, I was just expecting, for example, that you might be more looking towards gas resources and liquid resources or something like that. Do, even within your own company, do you see any Yeah, it, yeah on, the mar I mean, on the margin, of course, it, uh, if, if we could choose when we do exploration, we, the, on the margin, it, you know, it, we would be looking for extremely carbon efficient resources and, and things that, uh, that are under high pressure so we don't have to use any energy to get it out. And then light, sweet, and as light as possible is nice. And then you know, but uh, then gas has uh, some other issues in terms of uh, longer production profiles and, and less NPV. So, but but then uh, part of the game is that you know, we go out and explore, and we hope to find oil. Uh, most often it's water, and uh, and sometimes it's gas. So it's uh, so that, I mean, that's the, also the nature of the game. But um, but we will. Everybody's going to look for light, light, sweet, crudes close to the market. Get it up, comes out of the ground itself, and you know. But but that's not the world we're in. On, on demographics, when you look at modeling, um, so most demand is based on you know population, GDP growth, and then standard of living. But when you start looking at at a new generation, like in the United States, that may be driving less or sharing cars or doing something else, how do you alter that curve? Well, that is one of the sort of on a global level. That I, I think when I'm asked which which are the sort of the, the, a couple of the most important black swans that you have not accounted for, mm -hmm. and because if we if you account for black swans, they're not, not black, black right? They're right. white. Right. Uh, but uh, but uh, that is one of them. The, the, on the demand side, that is probably the biggest black swan, and that is what if future generations of consumers, and then it's not. OECD, that's the most important. Right. But it's, it's the future Asian consumer. Uh, what if they have a completely different attitude to consumption or to, to pattern of life, transportation, uh, than, than we do? So that they, when they, because they will be as rich as the average OECD uh, citizen one time in the future, 2040, 2050. Um, what if they have a very different pattern? They are, they are as rich, but they don't spend their money. Um, Partly we take that into account by, by sort of macro assumptions on energy intensity, energy efficiency. But that, that, because we, we tend to think of that as your refrigerator becoming more energy efficient, your car becoming more energy efficient. But it could also be that we spend less time in the car, we, commute, we, we live shorter distance from work, et cetera. So on a macro level, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's inca encompassed. In, I mean, in, in, in order for the world to become 60 or 40% more energy efficient, as what we have in his models, that's, it's partly there already. Right. But you know, a huge shift where, where it's it's also difficult to foresee. I mean, last uh, at least I check my kids. You know, it's uh, I, I don't see a, a a rapidly declining use of energy in their consumption patterns compared to to mine. Uh, they had big troubles. Uh, at least my son had the youngest of these guys had big troubles getting an agreement with the with the car driving teacher. But once he got it, he, he got the driver's license. It's, there's something about the text messaging generation not being able to, to, de to have proper dates. But, but, but they do get driver's license. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, in, uh, one of the, uh, in India, uh, India is a very small country. You wouldn't believe that. But if you look at 1.6 billion people living in that area, they will, by 2040, 2050, have 15% higher population density than the Netherlands. If they have the same car density then as Korea has now, each car has an area of 60 yards by 110 yards to move, if you tarmac all of India. Right, right. 
you won't do that. But, uh, but then, uh, so, so, so they will not use cars the same way we do. The right. cars will then, pro they, they might buy a car because it, you know, it might be the only place to have any privacy, but, but, it's, <laughs> but the car won't use energy because it will stand still. So, so, but, but, uh, but, so, but it is difficult to yeah. foresee. The, the other black swan is, of course, on, the, on uh, some on the energy supply side. Uh, I mean, when I grew up, we thought cold fusion was uh, 35 to 40 years ahead of us. I guess we still think that. Um, so, so, but, but, but fantastic breakthroughs on, on storage, um, our ability to handle large intermittent electricity production in the grids, mm -hmm. much, much higher than, what we, what, than the revolution we've had is also not in here. The, one, the revolution we have modeled is not in here. So, but, um, but on that side, I mean, storage and so the, the energy system is so huge that just trying to replace it in, in this speed is... Yeah, just it, standing still. Yeah, and uh, I don't know anything about, the, or I, I haven't seen anybody either trying to estimate how will the cost development of the components in a battery go when, when every household in the world needs some tons of batteries? Well, and how do you recycle them? Uh, yeah, and, and uh, once you've charged, is anybody here happy with the battery on their mobile phone once you've charged it 50 <laughs> times? So, so and, and, but also the yeah. size of the market, and, and we depend on resources that are scarce. Two, two of the key resources in the batteries in the Tesla, which is graphite and cobalt, are produced either in China, basically, or in Congo, and it's on the list of critical scarce resources that the EU has published. So, so there's something about large-scale battery storage that we haven't seen the market implications of either. And then for the renewable scenario, how, if, if nuclear, for some reason, goes away, uh, public sentiment, safety, whatever, costs, um, you can't, can you get there to the two degree without a big contribution from nuclear? Yeah, but then you would need something else. Um, we, we have put in, or we have a, um, a relative, well, we have a higher growth in nuclear energy in the renewal scenario right. than in the yeah. other ones because we think it's necessary. If the world's biggest problem is, is carbon, uh, then, then uh, the emerging economies will build more nuclear energy. Um, we have less nuclear energy than the IEA has. Right. So uh, we, we are more optimistic on renewable electricity generation than the IEA is. So if you have more nuclear, you can have slightly less renewals. If you have less, you need either, either more renewables more energy efficiency, uh, or more CCS, carbon capture and storage. We have le in our scenario, we have, we're less optimistic on carbon capture and storage than we have been historically previously, yeah. and we're less optimistic than the IEA is. But, but, but the flip side of that is then that we are even more radical on electrification of transport and, and renewable electricity. So you, I mean, you have, to, you have to do one way or the other. We've been experiencing seismicity concerns from a, a public standpoint. And anytime you change pressure in reservoirs, taking in or taking out, I mean, high pressure disposal of, mm -hmm. of anything is going to be a problem. Um, other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Eugene Tan, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, so I noticed in your renewable scenario, scenario you have gas demand growing. Um, until 2040, and I'm assuming that the purpose of the forecast is to inform your own decisions. To what extent does switching from coal to gas as a result of climate policies, how, to what extent did that forecast affect the decision by Statoil and other European oil majors to come out and say we want an international climate agreement? Well, I think... Uh, well, first, first of all, you know, the, the scenarios that I've presented here are, are input to those in Stadtol that are having the mandate to make decisions, and that's not me. Uh, and they use other inputs as well. Uh, so, so, but, it's, but of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, guess, I, I hope it's a pretty important part of the background for decisions, but, um, but I'm not sure. It might be some other things as well. Um, then on the, on, on the extent, sort of how, how do you, I mean, how does gas demand forecast affect your policies? So I think what is important to realize is that, for, in, in our case, for instance, a very large part of our gas is delivered to Europe. We're, we're hooked up to Europe with a lot of pipelines, so we, so, so we deliver most of our gas there. All the gas that we produce in Europe, more or less, 
with a few exceptions, goes to Europe. Um, European gas demand in our scenarios develops very slowly in all the scenarios. Gradual decline, very moderate growth. And what is important for us is not necessarily the, the level of demand growth. It's the difference between the level of demand growth and what we potential, that anybody potentially can produce from existing fields, right? So when we look at Europe, indigenous production is gonna rapidly fall. So the, so the need for import of gas to Europe from outside the EU is growing. And even if, they, even if EU reaches its own targets by 2030, climate targets that they agreed upon in the fall, the need for imports is, rough, is almost the same as today. And then that will have to be covered by Russia, us, or North Africa, basically, and LNG. So, so as, a, as an investment signal, it's not always the top line demand growth for oil and gas that is important. It's the difference between the, whatever demand growth you have and what you think can be produced. And in that sense, also the renewal scenario here gives very clear investment signals for oil and gas all over because of the, need, the, the big gap between what can be produced and what is demanded. So, and, um, and uh, I think also that when, when you look at sort of advocating for, for gas to replace coal, uh, part of that comes from, uh, part of that, or most of that comes from, uh, uh, if you think about how to deliver as much energy as possible within a given CO2 target, budget, ceiling, uh, then we, we get, you get twice as much energy uh, if you produce electricity from gas as coal within that per unit of CO2. So it's an efficient way of doing it, and in particular because we think it's, it's a relative, I mean, what we're talking about at the moment in Europe is perfectly functioning gas-fired power plants being mothballed. It's, it's, uh, it's extremely expensive to replace that gas with renewables to take out coal when you already have the gas-fired power plant in place, right? So it's also that part of the equation. It's that the, for, for the timing issue here is so that, that gas is a rapid way of getting, for a period, a rapid way of getting CO2 emissions down. It's a cheap way. And then at some point, gas will also have to either be equipped with CCS and gradually be phased out. But we cannot, we, what, what we're doing in Europe, at the, or what the, some of the European countries are doing at the moment, is they're, they're pushing in a lot of renewables, subsidized renewables, uh, eroding the price of carbon, at the same time benefiting from rel relatively low coal prices uh, domestically, and CO2 emissions are not going down as much as they could. So the sequencing is just as important as the... Yeah, sequencing and timing, and, and uh, when you look, I mean, we have countries that are still struggling to get out of the financial crisis. There's, there's not a lot of money to spend on investments that are inefficient, in a sense, but right. we still have to do that. So, so, so also an efficient solution is also important here. And I know, so you focused on 2040 longer time frames, but we all know that the, the current or the next five years kind of set the trajectories for what the forecasts look like, which is why we change these forecasts periodically. Yeah. But if I can ask you just to come back to the, the current marketplace. So what do you see in the current market? It, oversupply, lagging demand, oversupply persists. And what does this do to investment outlooks? Put your corporate strategy hat on for just a second. Yeah, well, I, of course, the, I mean, the, the current situation is, uh, is um, it's fueling my, my, my theory is, uh, is that the, the oil and gas industry and probably many other commodity industries also are permanently bipolar. We're either <laughs> depressed or euphoric. And at the moment, we're depressed. Uh, and and uh, that means, and if you look out, I mean, the signals of cost reductions, 30% reduction in, in investments, both in, in shale oil here and, and elsewhere, Rig, rigs are coming down, we're postponing projects. Uh, there is a risk, of course, that we're, we're also, some companies are not, but there is, there is also a risk here that the exploration programs are, are cut. Uh, that is a recipe for, for future much higher prices. So there's no, such, there's no better cure for low oil prices than a period of low oil prices. Right. So because what we're doing is, is we're, we're uh, probably speeding up decline for a period. Uh, some of the production growth that should come in and replace decline will be postponed. 
So within a couple of years, uh, we are talking about something that has to be much more tight. And then you stress test. And demand growth is slightly picking up also because of low prices, right? Yep. So, it's, so you tighten it more. And then if, uh, if we're back to the, our, then, then we're going to invest a lot as an industry again. So, but hopefully what we're doing now is also some of, the, some of the cost cutting activities that are going on now will probably be relatively sustainable. Right. And, and, uh, and the, the whole, uh, sort of hope that we don't overspend again. But, uh, but it's a, so, so what is happening now will fundamentally tighten the market. The, the, the issue is, of course, how quickly mm -hmm. uh, and what happens once prices start picking up. Uh, and, and in this period where shale oil in particular is, is uh, on the steep part of its S-curve, it, it is very flexible. So that uh, we are speculating that you know when pri when when uh, WTI prices come at 65 to 75 somewhere there, uh, some rigs will be put in place and start and people start producing again, and then you might get these plateaus where, for a period, then prices won't come up because because you have a flexible supply for a while. Right. But uh, but uh, fundamentally, we're uh, we're talking about uh, something that will tighten significantly going forward. Um, we are probably more cautious than than some other people in the market in terms of that. But, it, but it, you know, it's going to pick up. And, and you'll see the same on, same on gas, but, but that's a slightly, it, it takes longer. It's right. slightly slower, and uh, there are other factors there. There's, we suddenly had a big chunk of LNG coming out in the market at the same time as, as Asian demand came down. So, but it's um, the current, uh, the current, or a price around 50 is not sustainable. A price around 140, which we had in 2008, not is not sustainable. Right. There is a ban there. And then there is a gradual increase in cost because we're talking about a non-renewable resource. Okay. <laughs> All right, Scott and then we'll go. Hi, TJ Conway of Energy Intelligence. Uh, just continuing on the uh, topic of sort of the medium term, are there any particular issues or developments, signposts that you're looking at during that time period that could dramatically affect the probability of one of the scenarios coming true or not coming true? So just kind of taking it another step. Well, uh, I mean, it, it's the thing about these scenarios also that, uh, yeah, of course you can, uh, see, um, since they're global and they are so, you know, they contain so many facets, you can always find, uh, you can always find some elements in the development that makes you believe in an increased likelihood of them. Uh, happening and and last for for the la last year scenario we have you know the the, the, the geopolitical development looked like uh, the the rivalry type of scenario was uh, was increasing in likelihood but at the same time the EU was able to agree on its own climate targets we had a handshake between Barack Obama and Xi and we now see increasing signals from the G7 as, as well that there is an attitude there might be an attitude change towards uh, global climate policies that could lead to an increased uh, probability of the renewal scenario. Uh, and at the same time, uh, individual developments in each in countries and so go in all directions. So, uh, but of course, uh, every, I mean, the, the, the Paris meeting uh, with its, in, and, and the aftermath of the Paris meeting, I, I think we should be careful in overestimating the importance of, of the meeting itself. But, but things that happen around that meeting um, could be important. Um, and then we're looking at, I mean, the presidential election here might be an important signal as well in one way or the other. Um, the potential lifting of sanctions on Iran and, uh, and, uh, and the, the, what that does to relationships between Saudi Arabia and Iran in the Middle East is also an important indicator. Uh, that could go both ways, but, it, but, it, but it's, um, the, the lifting itself is a signal that the rivalry scenario might not be the most relevant one. So, yeah, there are many of these. And, and, and that's the exciting part about these scenarios is that uh, that you, you, have to, you have to keep reading the newspaper to find signals on which one is uh, getting more likely. Mm -hmm. And then on the, on the, the and then also, um, something is happening uh, on, something very exciting is happening on the technological side on, on renewable energy. And, and uh, the unfortunate thing in one sense for, at least for, for, for the renewal scenario, is that uh, these things are still so small that, it's, that, it, that it is going to take a while until it, takes, uh, until it has significant impact globally. But, uh, but there is uh, clear s signals there about the breakthroughs on, on, uh, on uh, the ability to store energy or to, to continue to produce uh, with, uh, with solar panels, et cetera, et cetera. 
productivity increases in that industry as well. It's, uh, it's also something that we should follow. Eric, I know you've got a number of different presentations you have to do today, <laughs> but, and now actually with the tee up of the question of uh, the changes that we're looking at, we're looking forward to the 2016 version of this report. Um, but if you'll join me in thanking Eric, and, and we want to continue this discussion, so mm -hmm. when you come back, we'll go in a smaller session or go public, and mm -hmm. welcome to have you back. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Good work.